day in God's house. Good to see you, Miss. What's your name again? Just joking. Good to see you, Miss Sandy. I'm teasing with you. It's been a while. Glad to see you. Glad you're here. All right, we are glad you're here today, and happy Palm Sunday. And one week to go from Resurrection Day, Easter Sunday, so we're going to think about these things today. I saw some palm branches come in just a moment ago. And Pastor put in the bulletin here, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Well, if you would, stand with me, please. And we're going to sing a song this morning, Blessed Redeemer. All right, I need you to sing loud. Some of the notes are a little beyond my octave, so we're going to do our best on this here this morning. Sing with me here. Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walk Christ my Savior, weary and worn, facing for sinners, death on the cross, that he might save them from endless loss. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding for sinners sinners while in such woe no one but Jesus ever loved so blessed Redeemer precious Redeemer seems now I see him on Calvary's tree wounded and bleeding for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Oh, how I love him, Savior and friend. How can my praises ever find end through years unknown? My tongue shall praise him forevermore. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding for sinners. dying for me. Amen. Thank you for singing along with us today. And again, happy Palm Sunday. We have an 18-year-old in our midst who was an 18 last time she was here. And we've got to love on her just a little bit. And we've got two 11-year-olds too. And in Sunday school, I told them, I said, we're going to sing to you guys one more time. So Bethany, come on up. She just turned 18 years old. Can you believe that? And Joseph and Andrew, you guys also can come on up too. Now, we gave them some ribbons this morning, but we just want to sing happy birthday to them right now. And uh, Bethany, obviously, is someone that we prayed for many years ago for a long time. And there was a lot of uncertainty about what God would do, and, but uh, we just trusted him, and her parents trusted him, and God has given her a good, long life so far. And... Uh, <laughs> so we're glad they're here today let's sing happy birthday to them as promised and i'll come down here with you guys ready happy birthday to you happy birthday to you happy birthday god bless you happy Give them a big 
Oh man, that's a special blessing just to get to see all of them and especially for Bethany with the years of cancer that she had, but cancer free now. And so just keep her in your prayers as she goes forward. She's got one more year of high school left and then that's it, you know, so just keep her in your prayers. All right. Well, we're so glad you're here this morning. What's that, Miss Betty? Ratner out. All right. We got another one there. All right. Well, we're already in the singing mood. Come on, we're going to sing to you one more time. Yeah, I think that's why they waited, so that you would have to be by yourself. So. No, she used to be my uh, grandma. I don't know if you change it. Is there anybody else who's going to rat anyone else out? Not yet. All right. open in a word of prayer, and then we'll let you be seated for a couple minutes. Uh, Brother Danny Dove, would you mind asking the Lord to bless today's services? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. But well, we really are glad to see you today. And this time of year is a great opportunity to really uh, put forth effort to push the mission of Christ through our church to people and just to be a, an let it be an opportunity to invite others to church. And we know that. But I want to give you a couple thoughts on some ways to do this. And I mention this from time to time. But I think most of us at this point probably have smartphones. If you have a smartphone, uh, then you know you can pull up our church website, and I run the website. I, I put it all together, and it's all set up, and I make sure that it is also set up for mobile use. And so you can pull it right up on your phone. And I don't know about Android phones, but I know Apple phones. I'm sure Android can do this as well. But with Apple, you have the little share button at the bottom. It looks like a square with an arrow. If you pull the website up, especially if you were to pull up the events and activities page, and you just click it right at the ribbon at the top, it'll say events and activities. When you pull that up, it'll bring up uh, the flyers, pictures, and things like that of the events to come. And we right now we have today's services on there. We have this coming Easter service as well. I don't have the spring revival on there, but I'll add that as well. And what you can do is you can share that with friends, and that is an easy way to invite somebody to any of these services. It's very non-threatening in a way, you know, you can just say, like I do that with people all the time, I say, hey, I was thinking about you, and uh, I just want to send you a picture of something that's coming up, or check out our website at the church. We, I, was, I, I was just had you on my mind for this special activity or this special event, and would love to invite you, you know, no pressure, but I was thinking of you. If you just do something like that, usually, real quickly, you'll get an emoji back with thumbs up, starry eyes, smiley face, easy, right? And uh, whether they come or don't come, you did your job. At least you did the first part of it. The next part is to pray for them, right? And that's all there is to it. And it's, we live in such an age... There's a lot of negative we can say about the times we live in, but there's a lot of positive too. 
And it's probably easier now than ever before to invite somebody to an Easter service, right? And um, you can do that. Another way you can do it is you can just take your phone and snap a picture of any of these posters. You can do that any time. And you snap a picture of it and text it to somebody and say, hey, we've got a spring revival coming up. You really need to come and hear Pastor Sutton. He's a great guy, gentle soul, gentle spirit. He preaches good. He, he understands the Bible. He'll help you understand the Bible. That's what, I mean, usually that, that's the compliment that seems to stand out most when people say anything about preaching is you help me understand what the Bible is saying. That's what I would tell people. I would say he will help you understand what the Bible is saying. And that's a great way to invite people. And you never know who might be looking. Pastor gave the testimony just the other day of Betsy Smith up at the hospital. And funny, Mrs. Boyd knows who that is. And we talked about it in Sunday school. But Betsy was in his room when he, had, when he was in the hospital last week. And he was talking with her. Mrs. Mays was there. Gave her the gospel. He said she was one of those that was just ready for it. And she, she was emotional about it. Not that emotions mean anything. But it just showed that her heart was tender. And uh, she called on Christ to be her savior. And now, uh, that'll change her life r alone, but if she'll grow, and we ought to be praying that she comes to church here sometime or finds a good church, the Bible preaching church, she will grow, right? And that's the goal, and that's the goal for all of us. So let's, that's a great way to just get the word out, and this is that time of year that we should be doing that. And I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, if we want to be here in the next generation, we have to do that, right? We have to get the word out right? Uh, you don't seem to agree. I have some bad news. Some of us might not be on this planet in 10 years. Some of us might not be here in 20 years. In 30 years, I'll be 70. I hope to be here another 30 years after that. But if I don't live to 100, there's a day I'm going to die. If we don't do our job now, there won't be anybody to replace us later on. We are the future by doing what Christ called us to do now. So that ought to encourage us, invite people. And you're not going to get an easier opportunity than Easter, okay? And uh, the spring revival as well. All right, well, we wanted to tell you about that. Tonight, we have our communion service. And First Baptist does things. We try to be biblical in everything we do. That's really the, that should be the pride of our hearts, that we really try to do things God's way. And as best as we understand from the scriptures, we do communion God's way, and so our communion is it's not open to all the community, and the reason being is that Jesus didn't, he had thousands of people following him, yet you only see 12 disciples take communion with him. It was his close followers, and so at First Baptist, it's for membership. Uh, we do it in the evening like that. That just helps it be a little easier because it's usually members that are showing up in the evening, and it's a, it's a reflection time. The, and I won't say much because Je uh, Jesus, pastor, is going to preach about the body and blood of Jesus tonight, I'm sure. And that's a compliment, isn't it? <laughs> Call you Jesus, and boy. Uh, but anyways, uh, but I'll tell you, it's a reflection time. And today is a really a good time to reflect and think about it and just ask yourself, because before you take the body and blood of Christ, not physical, not literal, we understand that. We don't believe in transfiguration, I mean, trans, transubstantiation, transconstantiation and all that. But it doesn't become the, the body and blood of Christ in our mouth or in our, in our stomach. There are religions that believe that. We don't believe that. It's a symbol. And this symbol is here for us to realize that if I'm going to take Christ in, I need to do so worthily. Lord, is there something in my life that I ought to give over to you? Is there something I need to change? Is there something, Lord, that you want me to add in? That's what that's about. It's a time for us to reflect. You can read more about that in the bulletin as well. So... We're really glad you're here today, looking forward to tonight as well. And if you would, go ahead and stand with me, and we'll sing another song. And this song really follows along with what I just said, and that is Take Time to Be Holy. And we'll find this, if you're using your hymnal, on page 223. Think about the words here. Take time to be holy, speak, to, speak oft with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word. That'll help you to be holy. Here we go. Take time to be holy, speak oft with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting enough. 
blessing to sing. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct His likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let Him be thy guide. And run not before Him, whatever be tied. In joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus led by his Spirit to fountains of love, thou soon shalt be fitted for service above. Amen. And one last song. This will be our song we fellowship on here this morning. And this is, There is a Fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's vein. Amen. It's because of that we can go to God. <clears throat> there is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood, Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief. Rejoice to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. And there Though vile as he wash all my sins away, dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more, be saved to sin no more, till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Get around, shake some hands, we'll come back on number five, Mrs. Mays.
We'll give you a 30 second warning. We're going to start on five here. I know. We've got about 15 seconds. All right, here we go on that fifth verse. When this poor lisping stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a nobler, sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ben. And uh, all these birthdays around here, you guys are making me feel old. I'll tell you what, amen. Well, that helps. <laughs> We've got some people to pray for. We want to pray for Jeannie. She has uh, got vertigo or something like that. And uh, I don't know. Maybe she just doesn't want to be seen with Danny. I don't know. Just, uh, but uh, we... Uh, I need to pray for her. I appreciate your prayers for me, and I ask you to continue to please pray for me. Uh, most of you know that I was in the hospital. I uh, went in Monday. My wife uh, said I was not behaving right, so she called the ambulance, and, and uh, they took me up there. Evidently, I had a brain seizure, and uh, I had one of those before, but they tied that to a UTI, and this time they didn't tie it to anything, so now they've got me on this medication that makes me feel goofy. Do you ever take medicine that makes you feel goofy? And uh, anyway, huh? It's called goofy drops. Goofy drops, that's what they are, yeah. So uh, at, at any rate, I appreciate your prayers. Uh, you kind of wonder what the Lord's doing and so forth like that, and, and uh, we want to certainly ask God to take control of things and get glory in it all. Amen. Amen. And uh, you pray for my wife. She's, uh, all of a sudden, she's gotten real sweet. And uh, she's been uh, uh, making sure I get my medicines and stuff like this. And, and she hugs me. She's hugging me. I said, man, this is almost like I'm on a honeymoon now. And uh, so uh, anyway, we're just, uh, I'd appreciate your prayers. And Let's just pray for one another like that. This, uh, I, I do get concerned as to what's going to happen to this church if something happens to me, and I sure want you to be praying about that. We need to be looking ahead a little bit, asking God to uh, take care of things and, uh, and all that. So praise the Lord. We did get to see somebody get saved at, at uh, the hospital the other day, so... Yeah. If, I, if somebody got saved as a result of that, maybe that was what it's all about. Amen? And uh, appreciate your prayers and, and your thoughts. Brother Bob, sir, how you doing? Doing good. Would you like to lead us in prayer as we ask the blessings on this offering? Dear Father, we just ask you to be with us today in your church, Lord. We just join here in fellowship. And Lord, we just thank you for all that you do. And thank you for the building that you've given us. Thank you for those that have stepped up recently. I'm thinking of Brother Gibson, especially with the, the heating system and following through on the uh, air conditioners and windows. And Lord, I just uh, thank you that the church would be beautified in this way. I pray, Lord, that it would glorify you and that it would be pleasing to you in all that we do. Lord, I, th I just pray this, this morning for uh, Miss Jeannie and uh, also for uh, Pastor and also for Miss Shalina and perhaps others that uh, may be under the weather or not feeling well, uh, may be dealing with issues, uh, emotional or, or physical. I just pray, Lord, for your help there. I pray especially for Mrs. Mays. It certainly is hard on her when the pastor goes through these things and they don't even know what it is. And, uh, Lord, I just uh, I thank you that uh, 
for the light that came on at the hospital with uh, Ms. Uh, Betsy Smith being saved. It's just, Lord, uh, you work in the way that you work, and you work in your own time and your own place. Lord, I just uh, I pray for your forgiveness when we, uh, when we fail to realize that you have a will and that you have a way and that uh, we are to be faithful and good stewards of what you give us. We are to do what your word says to do. And I just pray that that would always be the case. Ask your blessings on the communion service this evening, Lord. Just pray that we would come in with clean hearts and, and just a, a willingness to meet with you and commune with you, Lord. And uh, we just ask your blessings on the offering we received this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Are we children doing children's church? Don't have many here tonight. Today. How many children do we have here? Hold your hands up. We've got one, two, three, four, maybe five. Oh, there he is. He's hiding. Uh, okay. I think we've got about five. Do you want to do it? It's up to you. Your call. Amen. All right. We'll let our children be dismissed at this time. And uh, no, Brother Bob, you can't go. <laughs> oh, 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 come on, he should. <laughs> <laughs> All right, amen. We, uh, you might have noticed, I want to say this before we get too farther in here. We've got these windows in where there were air conditioners. And uh, it's good to have Greg here. He was up in Michigan with his mother last weekend, and so uh, we're glad to have him back. But I want to just acknowledge the fact that he has done, uh, made this all happen, and really appreciate the work that he's done. He said he's going to come in sometime this week and start trimming it out, and, and uh, eventually there's going to be different kind of windows up there, and we'll, it, it'll look really beautiful in time. We appreciate everything, Brother uh, Greg, for everything that you have done. And uh, I hope you will appreciate what he has done, the sacrifice that has gone into making this happen. Uh, by putting in the windows the way they are, you get to see my face a little better. And so you may wish that it was back the way it used to be. I don't know. But, but at any rate, uh, we appreciate everything we'll you've done. We'll get you some blinds, too. Okay, amen. All right. <laughs> you got to try to darken things up. Amen. All right. Take your Bibles and join me in the book of Matthew, chapter 26. Matthew, the 26th chapter. Uh, actually, when we think about Palm Sunday, by the way, I've got palms in the back. The Roush's Funeral Home uh, gives those to us each year, and they are available if you'd like to take some and, uh, and so forth. I never have figured out what you're supposed to do with them, so I just they're just there. But we appreciate uh, people thinking about them. You say, what are the palm branches? Well, what they were originally uh, laid out before the donkey and Jesus would ride on it. They'd lay the branches out, kind of like we would roll out the red carpet uh, for a dignitary or somebody of that nature and uh, to appreciate and, and to acknowledge them. And certainly we need to appreciate 
and acknowledge our Lord and what he did. And uh, though I'm not going to really preach on this, I do want to preach on uh, the week of passion that Jesus has uh, gone through. Uh, But I want to start off by just telling you what this was about. When Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey, that was a fulfillment of prophecy out of the Old Testament saying that uh, the Messiah would come riding into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. And so when Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem, Jerusalem riding on the donkey, it was, it was uh, an indication to the rest of the, uh, Israel that Jesus was the Messiah. Of course, they rejected him as their Messiah. He immediately got off of the, uh, the donkey and uh, he uh, went into the temple and he began to throw out the money changers and he did all these things. And people began to ask, who is this? And, of course, part of that goes all the way back to the Passover when it was instituted back in the book of Exodus when Moses told the people that they were to, uh, on the 14th day of the month, uh, select a a lamb that would be the sacrifice. They they were, or actually it was on the 10th day, and they'd observe it until the 14th day. And uh, then they would slay it, and that lamb would become their sacrifice uh, for sins that uh, was to take place, that took place in their lives, so they'd have forgiveness. But they were to take that blood of the lamb, they put it on the doorpost of each of the homes of the those that believed. And uh, God said He's going to send the death angel through that night. And at the midnight hour, the uh, if there's uh, some, if, if there, the firstborn of each home would be slain, unless there was the blood of of the lamb. Uh, place there over the doorpost. By the way, it hasn't changed much because the Lord's still looking for the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb Jesus Christ, over the doorpost of your hearts and your lives. And if He does not see that, uh, then uh, then your your eternity is uh, not uh, secure. You need to be saved. And so <clears throat> that all took place. But when that took place, the people began to observe Jesus, and they watched him, and then uh, they began to uh, do the things that was was, uh, predicted that would happen uh, to eventually crucify Jesus. He was to be mocked, he was to be beaten, he was to be arrested, he went through, had the crown of thorns put on his head, and all the things that went on this way. It took place at that time. And this is what we call the week of passion, all starting when Jesus went into the city of Jerusalem. When we get to the book of Matthew chapter 26, I want us to read a few uh, passages here. And I'm going to jump around just a little bit so you follow in your Bible as I read. We'll begin in verse number 1, and I'll tell you where to go after that. It came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, He said unto his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Go with me to verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will ye give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Go with me to verse 36. It says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. 
Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that betrayeth me. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for what we can learn from it. I pray that we'd be able to communicate uh, the things that you want said this day. We do pray that that uh, the individual that might need Christ the most would surrender their life to you today and give their heart to you and be saved. Lord, we pray for the ones that might be watching online that uh, you would reduce the distractions, that they'll be able to focus on what's said. And Lord, that the words that are said would be clear and precise. And Lord, that you would uh, minister to every heart that hears, including those that uh, are here among us today. We pray your blessings upon our fellowship and upon the uh, the uh, children's ministries in the back. Lord, let your name be much honored and lifted up. We commit our way into your care and pray all these things. You be glorified. Be with Miss Jeannie as she is going through uh, some vertigo problems. And Lord, just uh, take care of her. Be with uh, some of the others that are going through hardships and difficulties in their lives. Lord, we put them in your care and ask that you would... Uh, help and, and encourage and, and be with each of them. Thank you for the ones that have lifted me before the throne of grace and asked you to help me with the things that I need uh, help with. Lord, I pray that your hand would be much upon this, your servant. We commit our way into your care. Ask God that you would be glorified, you'd be honored, you'd be pleased and smile on this church and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a fellow by the name of Kevin Green, and he was found to be guilty of attempted murder. Uh, he was accused of murdering his wife and their unborn child. Uh, his wife suffered severe brain damage and amnesia as a result of the attack, and she testified against him. Over a decade after that, the biological evidence in the case was run through what is called the DNA database, and it was matched to a serial killer known as the Bedroom Basher, who confessed to the attack, and as well as to the attack of five other murders that took place at that time. For this false arrest, Kevin Green spent 15 and a half years in a California prison, and he was exonerated in 19, 15, 1996. This is just one of 2,939 people that the Innocence Project has been able to see exonerated since 1994. A combined total of 25,600 years of imprisonment uh, among all these different individuals. They state that 88% of these people serve time for sexual crimes and that 22% served time for murder. Many of these people were on death row. Most had served more than one-third of their lives in incarceration. Some died while serving time and were exonerated after uh, they died in prison. Some of these people were arrested while they were teenagers. Most of these were exonerated through DNA uh, testings and and uh, maybe even the changed stories of some of the accusers. Now, when I think of time that was lost and uh, the lives that were wasted sitting in a jail like that, I just cringe. It bothers me. Knowing that they were charged with a serious crime that we know they did not commit or that they know that they did not commit. 
They did not get to see their families grow. In one particular case, uh, 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 one man did not see his sister for 40 years. Can you imagine the animosity that family members had against them during these times while they were uh, in jail? The emptiness, the lonely years that they lived, the, tra the travesty of justice that took place. Now, I say all of this to say this, that Jesus himself was falsely arrested. Jesus was tried and sentenced to die, though he had absolutely no criminal record uh, and had no reason for any of the accusations that were brought against him. Jesus' innocence was declared at least three different times by a fellow named Pontius Pilate who declared that he was innocent. I find no fault in this man, he said. As in any of these cases of innocence that we have mentioned, uh, we uh, have long lists of reasons that uh, people sometimes get charged and, and arrested and, uh, and uh, put in jail. Uh, it makes me kind of curious to know uh, how it was that Jesus was himself arrested and charged. We open the Bible to see that the trial of Jesus began in Matthew 26, where we have just read some of these scriptures. These same uh, things have taken place in passages such as Mark 14, Luke 22, and John chapter 18. While the crucifixion of Jesus Christ occurred in the mind of God from the foundation of the world, the Bible says in Revelation 13, verse 8, I want us to begin in our text with what has happened at the time of the Lord's arrest. Now let me preface this message by saying uh, this statement, that Jesus was not outwitted, Jesus was not outmaneuvered, and Jesus was not outpowered by anybody. You see, at any time, Jesus could have stopped everything by one word of his mouth. Uh, he didn't do that. And because he didn't do that, you and I have the hope of everlasting life. I'm glad that Jesus showed his mercy by not trying to defend himself. And I have the privilege of having everlasting life as a result of that decision. Now, historically, let me set the record straight. Jesus was innocent of all and any charges that were leveled against him. He was born the Son of God through the Virgin Mary. Uh, and let's understand something. Man inherits his sin from his father. The, way, the Bible says, for as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The thing is, is that Jesus was virgin born. His father was God. And because his father was God, he inherited his nature. And his nature had no sin in it. Jesus did not inherit sin. Even if we never sinned ourselves, we still have the nature of sin within us. And we have to deal with that. Jesus, God, uh, Jesus' father is God. And so he did not inherit sin. Jesus never lied. Jesus never cheated. Jesus never stole. Jesus never lusted. Jesus never murdered. Jesus never gossiped. Jesus never cussed. Jesus never abused himself. Jesus never broke any of the commandments that God gave that could be broken. Jesus never broke any of those things. Jesus said of himself, he said, I came to fulfill the law in Matthew 5, verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come, uh, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So in order to fulfill the law, Jesus had to keep the law perfectly, which he did. He did do this. Now, how did these people come to a point in their lives that they would falsely level all these accusations against Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing what some people sell out for? Isn't it amazing that people will lie and do things and say things and hurt others like this? And I look here in these first few verses that we've read there, verse 3 through verse 4, uh, some were, uh, I think, uh, one reason they arrested Jesus and accused him was because his presence convicted them. He says, then assembled, verse 3, 
uh, together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people and the, unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, Caiaphas being the high priest, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. You see, Jesus had something going on. You know, have you ever gotten around some people that, that just uh, their goodness was so great that it convicted you of, uh, you know, of, of things? You saw how good they were and you, you came up short in your own life and you looked at your life and said, man, there's something missing there. Well, that's the way it was. When you got around Jesus, you just kind of felt like you, were, you weren't uh, what you're supposed to be. Jesus in his goodness taught the multitudes. He healed the sick and he miraculously fed, fed thousands and he cast the devils out of, out of many people and raised, even raised the dead. He crisscrossed the nation over and over again, mostly on foot and with a kind of a ragtag rag -tag gang of uh, uh, men called his disciples. Uh, some became followers and some accepted Jesus and what he did for them. And uh, many others, they rejected Jesus. Many of those who rejected him did not want to change their uh, style of living. And, and so uh, they did not like to be around somebody that, that did because being around them made them feel bad. And they didn't like feeling bad. And since his presence convicted them of their wrongs, uh, you kind of get the idea that uh, some of the people began to uh, hate him. And imagine Jesus speaking to people who trusted in themselves to be saved and how they felt when Jesus told them that they themselves were lost. Jesus on one particular occasion in Luke chapter 18, verse 9 through 14, said these words. It says, uh, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, and one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. It was the Sanhedrin now that has gathered together in our text that we've read there in verse 3, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders of the people, they were the influential people of that day. And uh, they were a group of some 71 different men that were the ruling elders of the, of the Jewish uh, people. And uh, they were the leaders, they were the teachers, they were the ones that everybody looked up to. And you know, you would think that they would be the ones that would be pointing to Jesus and say, look to him. He's the one that will change your life. He's the one that will make you into the person you need to be. But instead, they, they uh, condemned him. <clears throat> Today, people are still bothered by the presence of Jesus Christ. Sadly, I asked some people to go to church and they, no, -uh, not me. I asked somebody to, uh, carry their Bible with them. No, I'm not going to do that. They go bananas. They start going nuts over things that you have asked them to do as, as believers, so-called, in Jesus Christ. So some were convicted by his presence. Secondly, some were bothered by his power and were jealous of Jesus. Look down in verse 5. The Bible says, but they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. You see, Jesus had crowds that followed him, but the Pharisees did not have crowds following them. Jealousy had ruined a lot of the relationships that they had. Homes had been ruined by jealousy. Do you know that? You look at King Saul, for instance. King Saul was jealous of David, who was going to be the next king, 
And so uh, the women would sing their songs. They said, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. And suddenly you see King Saul getting jealous and, and uh, he wanted to destroy David. Uh, the spirit of jealousy kind of makes people want to get rid of whatever it is or whoever it is that makes them jealous. It did not matter that God sent Jesus to be their Messiah. They didn't want him because they were determined to be rid of Jesus Christ. Jesus uh, bothered them. They made him, they, he made them feel jealous. These same men would later hype up the crowd when Jesus was arrested and, and uh, Pilate was wondering, what are we going to do with Jesus? And they began to uh, go around and say, you tell them, say, let him be crucified. And so they began to cry out, let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. Jealousy. Jealousy caused them to uh, want to get Jesus out of the way. It was a false arrest. It was a false arrest. Then there's a third thing. One was, uh, one was along, one of the uh, 12 disciples was really not a disciple, you see. He was jealous. He was jealous and, and he was kind of along, he was, he was along, the, he was kind of along the ride for the money, so to speak. Judas Iscariot, he was an imposter. Imagine the unexpected help that the Pharisees got when they began to seek out a way to kill Jesus. And, and when, they, uh, when uh, Judas Iscariot suddenly shows up at their doorstep and he says, I, I, I'll tell you where he is, how you can find him, and so forth. And he covenanted with them for 30 pieces of silver. For 30 pieces of silver, he would, he would do this. I don't think they expected this one of the 12 disciples to come and do this. Uh, the Pharisees did not come seeking Judas. It's sort of odd. Judas went seeking the Pharisees. Satan enters into Judas's heart and he takes these leaders down this dark road according to Luke 22, verse 3, John 13, verse 27. And the Pharisees, for the Pharisees, it was a problem solved. We're going to get Jesus. We're going to have him put to death. We'll crucify him. We'll get rid of him. Judas's, Judas's interest was that of money only. You see, he was not wanting to really betray Jesus in retribution or in shame or embarrassment or something like this. Uh, Judas was not wanting to get back at Jesus for something that Jesus did to him. He, was, uh, he had no complaint against Jesus. And later he confessed. He said, I have betrayed innocent blood. Matthew 8, 27, verse 4. Uh, the primary reason for betraying Jesus Christ was simply for money. The love of money is the root of all evil, uh, Paul says in Timothy. Uh, the primary reason for betraying Jesus was money, which he seemed to uh, have kind of an inordinate affection for, seeing that he was the treasurer of the twelve. And uh, so he made his intentions known. Uh, he promised to betray them in Luke 22, verse 6. And in this case, Judas was bringing men to Jesus, not for their salvation, but for their condemnation. This made the leaders glad. Oh, we got him now, they thought. We're going we're gonna to have him arrested. You tell us where to find him. He says, the one that I kiss on the cheek, he's the one you want to arrest. As though they did not know who it was. What Jesus what Judas sold Jesus out for was kind of, kind of insulting when you consider it all. You see, he, uh, he sold them out for 30 pieces of silver, but that's not a big surprise because the prophet Zechariah prophesied that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. You say, what is that? The priestly leaders uh, were surprised because this was the wage of a common laborer for 120 days of work, they say. Christ was not very esteemed very highly then. Sold for 30 pieces of silver. You know, I stopped to think about this. Jesus gets sold probably for a lot less than that today, does he not? I mean, people say, well, I, I, uh, 
uh, the, the offering plate kind of get, comes by and we kind of just let it go by and we just don't do what we're supposed to do as God lays it on our hearts. The low value that people put on the spiritual matters upon Jesus Christ shows up in the way people use their time and, and their possessions. I mean, we might criticize Judas Iscariot for selling Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, but there's a lot of people who sold him out for much, much less. And that's a sad, sad thing. How much is Jesus really worth to you today? How much is he really worth to you? From that time forward, Judas Iscariot was dedicated to the betrayal of Jesus Christ, the false arrest of Jesus Christ. Satan saw to it that that time would soon come. And uh, there, I think there's a lot of opportunities in our lives where people will be cha challenged to serve the Lord, but they won't do it. And they don't do it because uh, Satan's there to make sure you got something to distract you from what he wants you to do. It happens all the time. Then some traded Jesus Christ for their jobs. You look down in verse uh, 20, look chapter 27, and uh, look at verse number 27. Chapter 27, verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus unto the common hall and gathered, them, uh, gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers and they stripped him and put him in a scarlet robe and when they had plaited a crown of thorns they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and, and mocked him saying hail king of the Jews and they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head and after that they had mocked him they took the robe off uh, from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled and to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink, and they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vestures did they cast lots, and sitting down, they washed him there, and set up over his head, and his accusation written, this is the king of the Jews, then were there two thieves crucified with them, the one on the right hand and the other on the left. And the story goes on. You see what happens is that the Roman soldiers got caught up in their uproar uh, of things and they didn't want to oppose anything. And so what they did is they, they just did their duties. They whipped Jesus. They, they took and, and uh, uh, mocked him and, they put a robe on him and mocked him and put a, a, a reed in his hands and a crown of thorns on his head and they did all these horrible things to him. And uh, that's in spite of the fact that a fellow named Pontius Pilate declared him innocent three different times. It's kind of sad. These are the same people that pounded nails into his hands and into his feet and lifted him up on the cross. All this was in spite of the fact that, that uh, the events that Jesus was arrested for were all false. You know, I can't get over this. When Jesus was uh, resurrected, the, the soldiers that were there guarding him, uh, they fell over backwards. When Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and, the, and they, uh, the, uh, they asked him, are you, are you Jesus? Are you the Messiah? He said, I am. And they fell over backwards, the Bible says. That kind of would say to me, hey, you better leave this one alone. You better just leave this one alone. And so they, they did this and, and they, 
you, you stop and you think about the humility of Christ, they, them gambling with his clothes, and, and three hours of darkness they, they, that was on the earth, and they heard the cries of Jesus on the cross. One appears to acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God. One of the soldiers did. And he said, now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. You think many more would say the same thing, but just the one. You see, trading Jesus for work has always been a test of our faith. Let me tell you this. It's better to be poor and hungry serving the Lord than to be wealthy and full ignoring the Lord. Then there's some that thought of themselves wasting an opportunity you go back there to Matthew 26 and verse 36. We've kind of read all these already. But uh, you see that Jesus, uh, Jesus was, was uh, he comes to Gethsemane. His disciples are sleepy. It's late in the, it's early hours of the morning and Jesus can't sleep. He doesn't want to sleep. He knows that he's being betrayed into the hands of innocent. Uh, 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 he's the innocent being betrayed. And the disciples go to sleep and they're oblivious to what's going on. Uh, they didn't see the plan of redemption uh, being formed. They put themselves above the Lord. That was when uh, suddenly mobs started to appear. Uh, they, they came to arrest Jesus. Sometimes we don't see the value of what Christ has done. And so we dispense of its importance until uh, there's a catastrophe. Sometimes in the trials where innocent people get incarcerated, they take place because some people don't want to get involved. I don't want to be involved with this. Of course, Jesus came into the world to die, and this was his whole purpose. And, but uh, you kind of still wonder, why didn't somebody stand up for Jesus? Why didn't somebody stand up for Jesus? I mean, isn't it time for us who are... Uh, the children of God, the ones of the redeemed of God, isn't it time for us to stand up and say, not me, I'm not betraying innocent blood. We need to take a stand for our God, do we not? So some thought of themselves first. They wasted an opportunity. And then some got caught up with the mob violence. There in Matthew 27, verse 20 through 26, the people cried out after the Pharisees went among the crowd and says, oh, let's choose Jesus to be crucified over Barabbas, a murderer. Let's, let's, let, him, uh, let's let him be, uh, uh, be the one we select. And so they said, let him be crucified over and over. And the chant went on. The chant went on. There's the peer pressure. By the way, even Peter was pressured into making a decision. You're one of his disciples, they said. He said, no, not me, not once, not twice, but three times he denied Jesus Christ. And, the, and it was a sad thing. The Bible says the cock crew, and he went out and he wept bitterly because he realized that what Jesus prophesied, what Jesus said he would do, he actually did, and he felt bad about what he did. I think we ought to feel bad about our denial of Christ. Some get caught up in the mob violence. There's a story in the Bible in Luke chapter 24, verse 18, 19, other verses there about the two disciples that were on the way to Emmaus. Kind of conveys a certain amount of bewilderment as they were going along the way discussing the events that they had just heard. Uh, Jesus being crucified, I kind of wonder if the people after that event kind of were transfixed by the things that they experienced. How could this be? How can we live this time? I don't know about you, but we turn on the news and you see the things that are going on in our day, in our time, in our society today, and you kind of wonder, what's our world coming to anyway? I have an idea these people were thinking the same things. So they're on their way and Jesus appears to them. And 
And uh, they went home kind of transfixed by what it was. Jesus appeared to them. He vanished out of their sight. He said, did not our hearts burn within us while we talked with him? They walked some nine miles to Emmaus and the disciples were, were meeting in Jerusalem. And they turned around and said, we got to go back. They walked nine miles back to tell them we've been with Jesus. We've been with Jesus. You know, uh, Jesus on the cross, you know what he prayed? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sadly, many people don't think through what Jesus did for them, and so they kind of continue down that road of uncertain sadness and bewilderment. God has still been forsaken. God is still left on the shelf. God is not important to them. Here's what the last thing is, the seventh thing. Why was Jesus falsely arrested? Because love called for it. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. Actually, Jesus was arrested. He was tried mercilessly. He was judged. He was crucified. And he did it all for you and me. It was part of God's plan. Jesus said in Matthew, excuse me, in John chapter 15, verse 13, he said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Hey, you got a friend. Jesus said, I lay my life down for you. Jesus, yes, he was falsely arrested. But unlike the others in the Innocence Project, there was a purpose for him to be falsely arrested. It was to save sinners like you and me. It was to give us eternal life. So when we close our eyes in death in this world, we open our eyes to heaven in a new world. That's what it's all about, folks. That's why I'm here preaching today. That's why I stand here with an open Bible and tell you, thus saith the Lord. That's what will make a difference in who you are. This last week, we, it was my privilege. My wife was there with me and got to share the gospel with a nurse that worked there in the hospital. And I shared the gospel with her and, and she opened her heart up and willingly, I didn't have to talk her into it, she wanted to be saved. I love it when people are that way. I was praying that she'd be here today. <laughs> she might still come, you never know. But what Jesus did on Calvary 2,000 years ago, he did it for me, and he did it for you, and he did it for her, he did it for whosoever will. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to know he wants to give you everlasting life. I look at the people that were falsely arrested, and I look at their lives, and I say, oh, their lives are so wasted and so empty. There's nothing left. There's nothing there for them to uh, live for. I mean, just emptiness. How do you recover that? You don't. It's just lost. But Jesus did it for you and for me. And I'm so glad he did. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, you, you sacrificed your very existence so that we can have life, so that we can live, so that we can have uh, joy and peace, so that we can have life in this world more abundantly even. Purpose and peace and direction, all of these are privileges of being born again. 
Lord, if there's one here without Christ, it's my prayer that this would be the day of their salvation. Lord, make a difference in somebody's life today. Make a difference. Let somebody on this, what we call Palm Sunday, be changed forever. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Speak to that heart. We ask you to be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song of invitation. 185, if you need that song in your songbook, would you stand with me as we sing? Think about these words. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. To him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. If you need to come, now's the time. Sing that second verse. Lord, now indeed I find power and thine alone can cleanse leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all. He paid it all so you don't have to. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. All God's people said. Amen. Well, amen. Well, uh, be prayerful for tonight's service. Uh, there's some verses in the bulletin you might like to read prior to come and to prepare your hearts for the communion service. And uh, we encourage you to be here. Every member really ought to be a part of this. this uh, what does the Lord's Supper do? It, it unites us. We call it communion. That means with union. We get together. We lay aside our differences and we just become one in Christ. That's what God wants our church to be. It's called a church ordinance. So it's for the church. Just like baptism is the first ordinance. Uh, communion is the second ordinance. So you come. Uh, the Bible says we're to examine ourselves. Uh, check your heart. Are you in union with each other? If not, get in union. Forsake the sins. Talk to the Lord about it. Amen? It's for people that are part of our church. All right. Well, let's be dismissed in prayer. Uh, ask God to dismiss us. Brother Bob, uh, Danny, dismiss us in prayer. Would you, sir? Lord, thank you. God bless you. You're dismissed.